Good afternoon. It is a little bit after one. We have some meetings that uh, are still winding up. We haven't reached a quorum to accept our minutes from the last month's meeting, but in the sake of everyone's time, we may go ahead and get started with presentations, but we do have members coming in. So we'll allow just another brief moment for them to get to their seats. What if we ask the Madam Secretary to call the roll? Senator Gardler. Here. Senator Carr. Senator McDaniel. Senator Mills. Here. Senator Southworth. Here. Senator Storm. Senator Thomas. Here. Senator Wheeler. Senator Wilson. Here. Senator Yates. Present. Here. Representative Baker. Here. Representative Beckler. Representative Bojanowski. Representative Branscom. Here. Representative Brown. Here. Representative Callaway. Here. Representative Donahue. Yes, ma'am. Representative Dotson. Representative Fister. Present. Representative Frazier Gordon. Representative Freeland. Representative Fugit. Here. Representative Gooch. Representative Hale. Representative Heath. Here. Representative Huff. Here. Representative Kirk McCormick. Representative Koenig. Representative Lawrence. Present. Representative Miller. Representative Palumbo. Here. Representative Pollock. Representative Raymond. Representative Reed. Representative Roberts. Representative Rowland. Representative Sheldon. Representative Stevenson. Representative Tackett Lafferty. Present. Representative Tate. Representative Timoney. Representative Truitt. Here. Representative Wesley. Representative White. Here. Co-Chair Schroeder. Co-Chair King. Present. Co-Chair Pratt. Present. I didn't hear you. What'd you say? Additional members are still coming in the door. It do, does look like we do have a quorum. Do I have a motion on last month's minutes? And a second. All in favor of approving last month's minutes, please say aye. Aye. Very good. Minutes are approved. We will stay in order uh, as the agenda is printed, and we will start with Harrodsburg's 250th anniversary. So if my executive director of tourism will please come up with your guest, please introduce yourself for the record, and please proceed. Thank you. Um, my name is Derek Gray. Um, as Representative King said, I'm the Executive Director of the Harrodsburg Mercer County Tourist Commission and also the Chairman of the 250th Anniversary Celebration, which is happening in, uh, as you see, 2024. Um, I want to thank you all for allowing us to come speak, and uh, thank you, Representative King, for asking us to come speak. Um, I'm joined by some of the board members right here in this front row uh, behind me. Um, so um, if they don't care, I'll introduce them in just a little bit. Um, as we get started, what I want to do today is just kind of update you all what we've been planning for the last few years. Um, the 250th anniversary, or as you see, the semi-quincentennial or sester centennial, uh, for today's sake, we'll just call it the 250th anniversary. Um, this was kind of a project um, that our former mayor, Art Freeman, started three or four years ago and started a board to try to um, showcase what we have in Harrodsburg, being Kentucky's oldest city. Um, so we put together a board, um, and it's kind of, you know, we're a 15-person board. Um, so today I'll just go over what we've been working on and what we have planned for the next few years. Um, our mission is to felicitate the celebration of Harrodsburg's 250th anniversary while leveraging this historic event to foster civic pride, involve lo local stakeholders in collaborative efforts, support ongoing community initiatives, and promote the future cultural, social, and economic development of the community. Just a little brief history. Um, as you all are probably all aware, we are Kentucky's oldest city, founded in 1774, uh, founded by James Herod on June 16th, 1774. It is the first permanent English settlement west of the Allegheny Mountains. Um, and then just a little information, the city has a population of 9,112 
county uh 22,850 that was in 2021 so it's probably changed a little bit but not much and then that picture you'll see is old fort Harrods state park um 250th board of directors uh directors as i said my name is Derek gray i'm the chairman um, our vice chair is jill cutler she is over the chamber of commerce she's the executive director uh, miss nancy hill is back here um, right there she's our secretary noel turner he's right over here he's our treasurer caitlin harder she's behind me um, she is our director of our main street program harrodsburg first so they are in charge of beautifying our main street um, throwing a lot of events on our main street um, david coleman who is old fort Harrod state park manager david kirkpatrick he's behind me as well and he is employed at the local library in mercer county and the others are listed um, Tony Preston, Tony Patterson, Lemayne Ellis, Steve Haddon, Barry Steele, Rosalind Turner, Scott Hammonds, Robin Ice, and, and Lois Matus. So just a kind of a scope that we've done. When I took over as chairman in June of 2021, um, we had closer to eight committees. Um, I really wanted to narrow it down to four to get our focus. I thought eight was a little too broad um, for what we were trying to do. So we narrowed it down to the history committee obviously being the oldest city in the state of Kentucky. We've, we've got a lot of history in Harrodsburg. Um, Beautification Committee, um, if we're wanting to welcome thousands to our community, so we thought it was important to beautify um, even more than we already are. Events Committee, obviously when we want to throw um, a lot of events in the year 2024 um, to showcase and bring people to our community and marketing, um, another obvious thing that you want to get out to the uh, around the state and country. We've created subcommittees, the fundraising committee, um, an abandoned property committee, as, as a lot of communities probably all have those abandoned properties they want cleaned up. So we're really putting initiative to get those cleaned up, especially on the entryways to Kentucky or to Harrodsburg. Um, it's, you know, along Highway 127, along Highway 68. So when these visitors come and then murals, um, we're really putting an emphasis on trying to beautify by um, putting a lot of murals throughout the town. So as of now, we've uh, narrowed it down to a four-day festival in 2024, which will be June 13th through 16th, which is a Thursday through a Sunday. That Sunday will be um, the actual 250th birthday. Um, the festival will reach from our Main Street down through Historic Child Street to Old Fort Herod State Park. And um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Herodsburg's downtown, that's basically three streets in a row. So. Um, you know, we those are our main areas that we want to focus on is our downtown and obviously Old Fort Herod State Park. Um, right now we're in the process of trying to get some updates done to Old Fort Herod State Park as it needs a lot of work. Um, and so we're hoping to have a lot of that done by 2024 um, to get that ready for this big uh, celebration. Um, as you'll see, Old Fort Herod State Park is going to be host to a lot of our his historical reenactments, speeches. Um, Mr. Coleman back here has a lot of exciting things planned for there that he's been working on. So, um, you know, obviously we want to show that off Main Street. Um, Caitlin and her group will be charge of, you know, a lot of live music, kids activities, vendors, food trucks, et cetera. Um, and then Child Street, which is in between Main Street and Old Fort Herod State Park will be um, a lot of those same things, and there's also historical May Morgan Row where our histor historical society is. So, you know, the goal is to bring people here who may be interested in music. Some may be interested in, in history. Hopefully they cross over in that path. Um, you know, some people may be interested in music, but they don't know anything about Harrodsburg. Well, that close a walking distance, we hope to get them to the fort um, to showcase what we have there. Our history committee, this is some of the things they've been working on. Um, at the first one you see is one of the most excited, where things we're most excited about is a children's book, and that was uh, David Kirkpatrick's. Uh, I think that's his brainchild right now. He's working on that. Um, but one thing we want to do is educate the children in our community and the surrounding communities about our history. Um, sometimes history is kind of lost, and um, we think that's an important way to reach those and get that in the school. So um, we're also working on a one-hour documentary. Um, and some of the other things you can read there, walking tours, book signings, reenactments, um, church services at Old Mud Meeting House. So we're excited about what the History Committee is doing. Obviously, that's one of our biggest focuses um, for 2024. Here's just an example. Uh, if you all can read that children's book, as you'll see, the, decor the artwork is obviously um, related to for a child. The reading is a little bit simpler, so children in elementary school are able to understand that. So... We're excited about seeing that come to fruition. The documentary on Harrodsburg, um, I'm not sure if you all are familiar with Michael Breeding. Um, I'm sure that writing on the right is 
a little too small for you all to read, but that just shows some of the great things he's done. Um, this this documentary he's actually about to start on, and he'll be filming for four seasons in Harrodsburg. Hope to have a spring release in 2024, and it'll be based on the past, the present, and kind of a look ahead of what we want to do in Mercer County. The Beautification Committee, as I told you all, is working on mural projects, um, the cleaning up of abandoned property, as we discussed. The City Commission has just recently recommended a project to put a new park along 127. Um, that is kind of the entryway to Harrodsburg, and we'll be honoring our veterans. So we're excited about that potential. Um, the tree board obviously is planting trees around town. As I told you all, the entryways is what we're working on. So we're updating the signage, welcoming people to Harrodsburg on 127 on each side, north and south, as along as looking at installing a new sign on Highway 68. Um, there is another new district called the Warehouse District, um, which is still in the process of getting cleaned up in Harrodsburg. There's several uh, businesses down there where we want to host some other events as well. So we're working on getting that updated. And then we are also working on beautification of Kentucky's oldest street, which we are also home to in Harrodsburg, which is our Broadway, which has gone over, done a lot in the last few years and still got a little bit of ways to go. The events committee, um, pretty cool picture there. That was actually from Oktoberfest this year in Harrodsburg, um, where we don't have exact numbers, but thousands upon thousands were there. So that's kind of a small scale of what we want to uh, this to look like. That's just one of the streets. We want all three streets to maybe not be that <laughs> that tight quarters, but pretty close. So um, that uh, the Vince Committee, we were playing live music acts on Main Street. You know, originally we had our eyes set on uh, your Chris Stapletons and your huge names. Um, we've tried to recently get a little more realistic. You know, we won't, we would love to get those, but you also got to make sure you have the infrastructure to handle these type of acts. So um, we are looking at local acts and also trying to get a little bigger to some outside acts. But um, any suggestions you all have, you want to throw our way for some music acts that'll bring you down, just let us know. <laughs> Um, reenactments at Old Fort Harris State Park. Um, I'm sure you all have been to Shaker Village of Pleasant Hill. We're going to be th hosting a lot of events with them. Um, we're excited about the things they do there, so we're excited to partner with them. They've got a lot of cool things they haven't released yet um, that they are going to be doing there. So we will also be having um, events on Kentucky's oldest street, as I said, events at our local park, Anderson Dean Community Park, um, events at the Mercer County Fairgrounds, which is also home to the longest consecutive horse show in the nation. Um, I think it's at 195 years consecutive. So um, events in the war warehouse district. And we are actually looking to partner with Triangle Talent who hosts the Kentucky State Fair and all their events. So um, we'll leave it to the professionals to take on that task of welcoming that many people. Uh, that brings me to marketing. Uh, myself and Caitlin behind me are um, involved with that committee. Um, and, you know, obviously there's a bunch of different ways to market billboards, TV, radio, obviously the big one's social media. And we're looking at creating an app as well that'll help make people getting to Harrodsburg easier, but also while they're there, guiding them, letting them know the events that are going on easier. We've created a website um, with a countdown to the date, magazines, and then um, we're obviously collaborating with the Harrodsburg Mercer County Tourist Commission which is where I'm the executive director, and we are hoping to partner with the Kentucky Department of Tourism. Which brings me to the fundraising committee. Our current budget is $41,000 is what we have. We're expecting this event with all of the projects to be a minimum of $500,000. Um, the Mercer County Tourist Commission currently has $175,000 in reserve to give to the um, event. And then we're still looking at raising $284,000 to hit that $500,000 budget. Um, how do we plan to raise the rest? Obviously, we're going to go to local businesses and try to get sponsorships from around the state and grants. Um, we're still searching that, but still have ways to go to get to that $284,000. We do appreciate the Tourist Commission Board agreeing to set that money aside, but there's still some work to be done. And lastly, our goals. You know, we want to show the case the rich history of Kentucky's oldest city. We're very proud of that. That's something we hang our hats on. Um, we want to embrace the growth of Harrodsburg and Mercer County since 70, 70, 1774. We want to prepare for the future of Harrodsburg and um, what we've got planned ahead. We want to bring visitors from around the state and nation to Mercer County and Kentucky. With that being said, you know, the Oktoberfest photo I showed you, we had people from 48 of the 50 states, excluding Alaska and Hawaii. So we, uh, we want to continue with that growth. All of our events in Mercer County have been bigger this year, numbers-wise, than ever in history. And that's just a good way to lead up for this 250th. 
And lastly, we want to provide educational opportunities for the students in Mercer County and surrounding areas, as well as the citizens of Kentucky and beyond. With that being said, uh, I appreciate you all letting me be here. And any questions you all have, I'll try to answer one of these behind me. I'm sure can. So. Thank you, Derek. And without us uh, talking about it, you absolutely read my mind. When I was formulating the meeting, it was connecting the past, the present, and the future. I mean, you just read my mind, literally, of what I was anticipating with both sets of presenters. So Yeah, that's that's huge on us, as you said. The tons of history there, obviously, yeah. and uh, we're excited about what we have now, but we, we've got a lot of work to be done in the future as well. Absolutely. Are there any questions from committee members? You're always welcome in Mercer County, but we look forward to having anyone available to come down and see us uh, June 13 through 16 in 2024. That's right. Absolutely. Thank well, you all so much. We appreciate the entire 250th committee taking time out of your busy days uh, to come down and help us understand better about, uh, and I joked when we were passing the resolution that semi-quincentennial and sister centennial were our sesame street words of the day you know right. when, uh, when we were talking about those uh, in passing that resolution thank you all so very much for being here thank with you. us today we appreciate you and it's my understanding as our presenters are changing table uh senator thomas may have guests to introduce thank you madam chair uh, madam chair i have visiting with us this afternoon, the International Public Policy and Management Institute of the University of Kentucky. Of course, that's part of the Martin School of Public Policy Administration, which is uh, well known, not just here in the University of Kentucky, but throughout the nation. Uh, Dr. Uh, Do Oak Kim, I think I got that correct, uh, is the director of the International Public Policy and Management Institute, and he's standing right before us. Uh, he's brought students from South Korea that, that want to learn more about the state government. They, they're pretty familiar with uh, our federal government here in the United States. And everyone here knows, every community member knows, that South Korea is very strong allies with the United States. And these South Korean students want to know more about how we do, how we operate state government here in Kentucky. So I invited them here to sit on a committee meeting and see how we conduct business. Uh, and I would like this committee to, 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 to welcome uh, uh, prefer Dr. Kim and the South Korean students here this afternoon. Thank you, Senator Thomas. We certainly appreciate you bringing your esteemed guest with, with you today to commit. Welcome, welcome. We appreciate you being here today. And if you have any questions, uh, please just let us know. Thank you all for being here. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Hello, I'm would you like to approach the uh, the table so we can have you on mic? You're... There will be a little button on the microphone stand. Just make sure it's illuminated. Please have a seat and introduce yourself. There's a button on the microphone. It will need to be illuminated. Push. Hello, uh, I'm very honored to the attend. Uh, this uh, the uh, committee and my host is the Senator Thomas and the Senator Yeh. Thank you so much again. And my students, they are from South Korean government official, and two of them from the Korean National Assembly. The one lady are from uh, the state government. And I'm the professor, I'm the director of the International Institute at the Martin School on the University of Kentucky. Uh, currently this semester, around the 40 people, uh, they are studying under my program. Uh, I am the bridge between the America and the Korea. I am bridge between the Kentucky State and the South Korean government. I am very honored, proud of my position and my role, my responsibility for the contribute to the Kentucky State government. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you so very much. We appreciate your leadership there uh, with your students and Hey, thank okay. you so much. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Please welcome our guest. Now, would our park commissioner, Russ Meyer, and his special guest please come to the table? You're no stranger to this committee, but please introduce yourself for the official record. Again, thinking about past, present, and future 
Um, I appreciate every one of our conversations over the summer, over the last two disasters, and everything you and your team have done. And I just wanted to make sure the committee knew uh, how you all have been serving. So thank you so much for being here today, and we look forward to your presentation. Yes, ma'am, Madam Chair, and thank you for uh, having us uh, um, again to, uh, to your committee to give you a report, answer any questions that you all may have about um, anything going on in Kentucky State Park. So we're excited about uh, what, is, uh, what has happened and uh, um, what's going to happen in Kentucky State Parks and what, what we've been able to do for the people of the Commonwealth, especially in Western Kentucky and Eastern Kentucky, um, with our parks, with your parks. And uh, um, it, it's pretty exciting. So with that, um, we'll introduce ourselves. I'm Russ Meyer. Um, Commissioner of Kentucky State Parks. Chris Crockett, I'm the uh, director of the uh, Ranger Division. Ron Vanover, I'm Deputy Commissioner for the Kentucky Department of Parks. All right. Our mission uh, with Kentucky State Parks is to provide a sustainable system of parks that delivers quality programs, amenities, and services, which create memorable experiences and a sense of place contributes to the economic growth of the Commonwealth and preserves the historic and natural integrity and traditions of, of our parks or for existing and future generations. Our vision for Kentucky State Park System is to promote Kentucky as an inclusive travel experience that welcomes visitors of diverse backgrounds and interests. Focus advertising efforts on encouraging travelers to take advantage of Kentucky's outdoor assets. Build public and private partnerships to ensure that Kentucky State Parks bring both recreational and economic value to the communities that relay on our parks as the primary tourist attraction. Pursue funding opportunities that will allow Kentucky State Parks to continue to address and continuous maintenance needs at each of our state parks. Protect and conserve Kentucky's natural resources and to be responsible stewards of the nation's finest state park system while promoting these opportunities to tourists, sportsmen, and sportswomen. We've had a couple uh, structural changes within parks and uh, Deputy uh, uh, Commissioner Vanover is going to explain those to you. First, let me say it's indeed a pleasure to be here. Can you make sure that your mic is on? The little green light will be illuminated. And it's on. I'm just probably not close enough to it. Let me say it's indeed a pleasure to be here. Um, you're probably wondering what I brought with me today. I, I have over 30 years of experience with Kentucky State Parks and various parks in our Commonwealth, but when Mrs. King and I were discussing history, I told her I had a fiddle in my family that was played at Cumberland Falls before it was even a state park. So that was circa 1920. So I have brought that today after the meeting in case anyone would like to see a part of Commonwealth's history. To the best of my knowledge and others, the Kentucky Department of Parks had not had a reorganization in over 20 years until recently. Overall, the reorg is budget neutral. The reorganization now makes up a solid commitment, whether it be Eastern, Central, Western, with regional administrators for each region and managed by a director of park operations. Total parks include 45 parks, one rail trail, one state scenic trail, and as Representative Lafty will say, we forgot one, and that's Brakes Interstate Park that we share with the Commonwealth of Virginia. Many people don't realize that. In addition to those structures, we also have a ranger division that has structured themselves to east, west, and central as well. By streamlining this effort, we now have a system that will benefit all of our parks and their employees and improve efficiency, management, and accountability. Moreover, the Department of Parks has an engagement division, that's a big word, that works with visitor services through recreation and interpretive naturalist-led programs 
and special events to engage visitors about the conservation and biological programs at various state parks. In addition, the state naturalist and the director work with all parks to provide quality programs that entice these visitors to come back through memorable experiences. We also maintain an extensive database for all of our volunteer organizations. That same department, the Engagement uh, and Interpretation Division, now directs all of our trail towns in the Commonwealth. The Kentucky Trail Town Program is a tourism and economic development initiative designed to provide a strategic plan for communities to capitalize on local travel opportunities. That program recently welcomed Liberty, Burksville, and Hyden. And I'll carry on from there. Our Kentucky State Parks play an essential role in our state's emergency response efforts. During the pandemic, an array of services provided by our parks created an opportunity for us to provide necessary resources that position the Commonwealth at, ad at advantage for fighting the virus. Four Kentucky State Parks provided temporary housing for first responders, frontline healthcare workers, and low acuity patients, utilizing over 2,000 room nights as a low acuity shelter. Some of our parks also served as vaccination sites. The December 11th Quad State Tornado was the worst tornado event in state history, with at least four tornadoes devastating eight Kentucky counties. The devastating event resulted in the governor declaring a state of emergency. The emergency declaration ensured that federal funding was available to provide emergency resources and rebuild our Western Kentucky communities. Our Ranger Division dedicated 33 Rangers and 6,868 Park Ranger hours to support efforts to rebuild our Western Kentucky communities. Park staff commute contributed greatly to the overall success. Our state parks served as a community resource by providing lodging for the American Red Cross utility crews, first responders, and displaced families. As part of the state's emergency response efforts, seven Kentucky state parks were designated to provide emergency shelter and food services for individuals impacted by the tornado. Our parks offered temporary housing to more than 800 individuals and 250 first responders. In total, nearly 2,600 individuals were housed by the programs offered through the state, Red Cross, and FEMA. I'm gonna talk about this next slide to show you the dynamics of what we were doing on the ground. So when you look at these seven parks listed, whether it be Kentucky Dam, Rough River, John James Audubon, et cetera, when we talk about relief rooms, as Representative King and I had talked with our commissioner many months ago, 3,122, those are not the amount of guests. It's the amount of overnights. So you could see as you go through with Lake Barkley, Penny Ryle at 3,689. That was in the heart of where this tornado came through. And we had to act quickly. We had to put boots on the ground. So that number sticks out higher even though it's a smaller lodge. In addition with our first responders, we're talking about our rangers, but we're also talking about our sister agency, Fish and Wildlife. We're also talking about the National Guard, people coming in to assist us. So overall, what I wanted to point out with this slide, we provided 13,300 overnight rooms. In addition, 4,815 first responder rooms. So together, we provided sheltering for over 18,000 rooms. We also look to our neighbors, 
our friends, our churches. We wanted to find ways of how we can keep people safe, but we also knew we had to feed them. And many people stepped forward, lots of donations. And with that, we estimate that we probably did 30,000 bills during that, that time. As I mentioned before, Penny Ryle Forest State Park, they did something in addition. We worked with Secretary Gray, the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet, and provided Kentucky Emergency Management trailers. Same way as what we're doing in Eastern Kentucky today. We had Coach Cal come in. Uh, the Samaritan Feet donated lots of shoes. If you weren't on the ground to see it, it was a devastation. I went over there during the 24th and 25th and 26th of December because I wanted to be a part of those processes. It was bad, real bad. So I'm glad that we've been able to work with our neighbors and our friends, working hand in hand, whether it be Kentucky Emergency Management, whether it be with our Ranger divisions, but we also had to look at behavioral health. We knew we had folks that needed that type of assistance. Our local county emergency management officials were on the ground helping us. They helped us, do, helped us do vetting along with our ranger division. And more importantly, we had people come from everywhere that even had to think about how do we wash their clothes? How do we make sure that we do that? So it took a lot of knowledge in the field to put this together. And with that said, we moved from the western uh, part of our state to the eastern part of our state when the floods hit in uh, July. And uh, the two pictures that you see, the top picture is uh, Carr Creek. That is the beach area that it, the water didn't make it to the campground, which is at the top of the hill. And the lower picture is Jenny Wiley uh, State Park Campground. And those are all FEMA trailers that are that you see in that that picture there. In July, as a part of the state's emergency response efforts in e eastern Kentucky, four Kentucky state parks have been designated to provide emergency shelter for individuals impacted by the flooding. Over 360 people impacted by the flooding have been temporarily housed at our state parks in eastern Kentucky. Currently, 645 individuals are housed in 320 travel trailers, including 65 travel trailers at Jenny Wiley and Carr Creek State Park. Since July, our park staff and volunteers have been working with the American Red Cross local churches, businesses, and restaurants to ensure individuals impacted by the tornado have basic needs, food, shelter, and clothing. In contrast, this is the same type of slide we were working at, looking at a moment ago. This is dealing with those same overnights. Buckhorn Lake was down for a little while. It was really destructive. I'm sure Representative Fugit could tell you more about how Buckhorn was at that time. No water, no electricity. So we worked very diligently to get that park up to where we could house people that were heavily hit in that Perry County and Buckhorn region. To date, of, as of the 13th, we provided 3,425 overnight rooms. Jenny Wiley has provided 5,554. Pine Mountain, we used them in case we needed them, but we knew they weren't in the flood area but we still ended up with 42 relief rooms. So for total running date is 9,021 re, uh, relief rooms. We've had visits by the governor, we've had visits by legislators, we've had uh, Mrs. Bashir, visits by Coach Cal, Shoes, et cetera. And if you look at working hand in hand, we had some of the same folks that were helping us in Western Kentucky. One thing I'll point out that's not on here, on this particular slide, is when you look at the amount of, of campers that you see in that Jenny Wiley campground, it's five miles from that campground 
to the lodge. So the dynamics of our people, our employees, putting things together to make sure that we're taking care of those folks over there at the campground has been magnificent as well. With that, we'll take questions. But, uh, you know, as uh, Commissioner Vanover stated, uh, you know, our Commonwealth came together, the people in this state came together um, during these uh, tragedies in our local communities. Um, you know, I know when we uh, had the floods, about two, three weeks into it, there was a, uh, a group from uh, Western Kentucky Cattlemen Group that came in and cooked for uh, the, the uh, displaced families at Jenny Wiley and the community there. They drove six hours to get to Jenny Wiley to cook for them that morning. So it was a true testament of coming together, reaching out, and, uh, and working for uh, um, the people in our Commonwealth, in your community. So it's uh, um, been wonderful to be a part of, been, uh, been tough on your communities and uh, people out in the state. So uh, um, with that said, we'll take any questions that you all have on what's going on in Kentucky State Parks what has gone on and what what we uh, what our vision is so thank you thank you all very much for reminding us just how vitally important you've been to the recovery in in both of those areas i think it's important <coughs> for this committee in particular to to stay on top of that and, mm -hmm. and make sure that we understand the many ways you've served we do have a few questions in the queue it looks like starting with representative branscombe Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a couple questions, if that's okay. Commissioner, good to see you. Good to see you, Representative. Thank you. Thank you all for this presentation. Um, and I, I think it's it's um, what the Rangers and staff have done during these natural disasters. There's no doubt the importance and the role that our state park system played uh, for our, during this and for our fellow mm -hmm. Kentuckians. So mm -hmm. first, I just want to say thank you all very much. Um, there was a comment earlier, we were talking about the sustainability of, of our parks for future generations, and I think that's so important. My area, Lake Cumberland, I have Del Hollow as well, um, so I'm, I'm a lake district. This is, this is, these are things that are very important to me. Um, there's been mention, I know we're not in a &R, but there's been, we, we have $150 million uh, coming, coming available for uh, park projects. Mm -hmm. I know there's a report that's supposed to be due here in the next couple of weeks. I think December one. I think that's somewhat the, the the deadline for that. And you probably don't have your numbers right here with you. So I'm just going to ask just just some basic questions um, on that. Um, I've heard you mention many times that we have a large need for. I think I think you call them have to projects. <laughs> Things like our uh, water and infrastructure. Um, uh, uh, structural issues at some of the parks, ADA, things like that. These are things that, that we've got to get got to get shored up. Um, as you're aware, uh, I think, in the, and I'm going to bring this up because this was a, a group that has come in and testified in, in our committee here in the interim, uh, which is the Burnside uh, Island State mm -hmm. Park. And mm -hmm. I know you, you, you spoke with Mayor, Mayor Lawson quite a bit and uh, uh, Chris Girdler. They've been very, very forward thinking and, uh, you know, trying to try to get ready to prepare uh, for this. Um, and obviously looking at some P3s as well w uh, with the money that's coming down. My question is, and, and I know that your report, uh, you don't have that out yet. Um, where do you see these projects like the, the, the Burnside Island project um, in this 150 million? I know we've got, like, as you said, we've got a lot of these have to projects, things that we've, we've got to get done just for basic infrastructure. But uh, these groups that like Burnside Island, they're looking to do these P3s. Where do you see them in that, that mix with the, the 150 million? Well, that's a great question and you know p3s are no stranger to kentucky state parks and then it's not a new concept it's it's something that has been going on for uh quite a long time i believe there's eight or nine rfps in past years have gone out on burnside island so you know we're in discussions with with uh that group right now and uh you know that's an important uh uh park in, in the Commonwealth, huge, I mean, a ton of history, uh, very important to the lake 
region that you're talking about um and uh is a is a very productive park too you know with the golf course there it's a, a top 10 golf course in the state of kentucky it's got a a campground that uh you know in most recent years we put um million and a half dollars in uh to reinvest in so that park has had you know a lot of reinvestment that that you're talking about that a that a lot of parks have missed out on so uh um you know with the 150 million um that we hope to get and and really appreciate uh your your all's forward thinking in uh bringing that to our state parks um it's uh it's much over needed you know when we were uh um going into uh our recession five years prior to that is when we should have been reinvesting in our parks, but yeah. but that was not at the at the front of the table. Then we go into a recession, it hits, and and the game changes here in Frankfurt. It changes in our local communities. Um, so now we have the opportunity to reinvest in our our state parks. Um, you know the the outlook has, is good. The economy's been great, and it and it looks great. So. Uh, um with that said how some of these groups fit in um you know with rfps um coming out um you know and those opportunities for for public private partnerships um that's where we're looking um okay. for for something like that but uh you know uh, deferred maintenance out there in our state parks as as you all know um, those that have been here for for many years um, and have just got, been in the legislature in the last couple years, deferred maintenance has ridden right around 200 million for state parks. So, and that was previous year's numbers where, you know, uh, to, to get a lot of these projects done, you know, your costs have risen just in the past year 10 to 30 percent so that that number has changed a lot so you know we've taken that into account with our presentation and we're excited to get that presentation to the a and r um, committee uh um, chair chair petrie and mcdaniel um, getting that to that committee and and in your all's hands so we can start uh, working towards um you know solidifying our state parks so if that answers your question it does uh, I, I appreciate that and it's, it's good to hear that there's conversations ongoing mm -hmm. with those because those mm -hmm. are um, all of us in this room probably have state state parks that are very important Absolutely. to our areas we understand the uh the economic impact of those and what that brings into yeah. to kentucky and and you talking about the sustainability mm -hmm. and really setting these up for our future generations we need to make sure we're mm -hmm. we're, we're covering those bases mm -hmm. and i know there's a un, there's a need um, with that deferred maintenance and it's probably it's a pretty healthy chunk of money mm -hmm. uh, but we've also got some of these projects like I use Burnside because that's close to my it's not in my district but it's in a county I represent and uh, we all have have state parks who have those needs and looking to to grow and expand and and um, I just uh, just want to make sure we're keeping that in focus as well and representative i also want to uh say that i truly appreciate uh, and i know everyone at this table um, truly appreciate you mentioning um, our state park employees because they have been yeah. unbelievable um, they are unbelievable each and every day but but through these uh, um, disasters the tornado the flooding um, you know they come together and and work across park lines and and go to those parks in need and uh have really done a phenomenal job um so thank you for mentioning them because they are uh they are why our parks work and uh um you know as you said too our state parks are a part of our community they're huge parts of our our communities the the economic uh aspect of our community so uh Thank you for mentioning that also. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Fugit. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a couple things, please. <clears throat> First of all, Commissioner, thank you all for what you did for the people of Perry, Breathitt, Knott, uh, Letcher counties, and other counties that were affected by the flood. And uh, just amazing to see, you know, how many people 
that came out of the floodwaters that had absolutely nothing, not anything, no shoes on their feet, wet pajamas, rescued by helicopter and taken to different places. And thank you for making Buckhorn Lake uh, available in, in other state parks uh, available to that. With that being said, I know the the job that uh, the park rangers do and uh, the employees there at Buckhorn. And uh, just just a plug for something that, that I think as a former state trooper that needs to happen is our park rangers are handcuffed as far as their authority across the state. Many of you may not realize this, but but they are all uh, certified police officers that went through the, the academy, DOCJT um, trained, that only have authority on park property, which means if there's a domestic or something 100 feet off park property legally, they're not even allowed to respond to that domestic uh, because they don't have authority. So we're working on legislation that would allow them to have, not to change the mission of the park rangers, not to change what they do on the park properties and not to put them out on the highways and streets and the hollers, but to give them a full authority like we did the uh, Fish and Wildlife officers a couple a uh, couple sessions ago and that's something that we're working on with uh, uh captain crockett i think is your title uh, uh so i'd love to see that maybe come come to pass this session and and we'll meet and talk about that but that's just food for thought for this for this uh, committee and then for the vmap committee but uh, the third thing is i think in the future for east kentucky adventure tourism is going to be a great big uh economic boost to the, the entire region. And so I look forward to partnering with Buckhorn Lake and other state parks in that region. Not not all would fit the bill, but for a place like Buckhorn Lake that's out in the middle of the boondocks, out in the middle of nowhere, that people that with adventure tourism, tourism wants to come in to stay at a place that's off the beaten path, so to speak, that we could partner, and I think we could re, uh, revitalize Buckhorn Lake State Park. I think we could fill that place up nine months out of the year with tourists coming in from other states uh, to bring their ATVs and hit the trails and go through the mountains and would eat their rent pontoons there in the evenings, fishing and all the, the, whole, the whole gamut of things that they could do uh, there at our park system. And so thank you for what you're doing, and uh, hopefully we can partner together on a a lot of those things to see Eastern Kentucky uh, be a place where a lot of people come to visit and ride through the mountains and see what God's blessed us with there in East Kentucky. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. You want Thanks. to comment on that, Commissioner Vanover? Well, Buckhorn's a special park if you've never been there. Um, it's one of my favorite parks for scenic views. Now, granted, it takes a while to get there, but I'm no stranger from taking a while to get there. I grew up right on the Tennessee border too, Mr. Branscombe. It's a beautiful area in those areas, but they're isolated. So uh, we appreciate what you do for us, Representative Fugit. Uh, we, uh, we are looking at relationships that we've kindled. For example, most recently with the Dawkins Line Rail Trail with our sister agency and um, and Commissioner, like Paintsville, I, I don't know if we have any representatives from the Paintsville area, but we did reach out to the judge executive there, groundbreaking ceremony, and they're putting $700,000 into an ADA slash kayak lodging grant. No cost to the state. It's their monies. And these are the type of the relationships we're trying to, to rekindle. Thank you. Thank you all. Representative Tackett Lafferty. Thank you, and I just want to say thank you very much. Um, just like um, uh, Rep. Fugit said, <clears throat> that your the parks, you Commissioner Deputy Commissioner Vanover, you know, have I've seen you at our local parks multiple times since these tragedies have have struck not only Eastern Kentucky but also in Western Kentucky I'm certain you've also been there um, but <clears throat> at this point I just really want to say thank you because I'm really I'm, I'm amazed 
with not only, you know, as you can see, our park is very beautiful and it's right now it's serving a beautiful purpose of housing people who've lost everything until they can get their FEMA claims or their insurance claims in a place to where they can go somewhere new. But I've also been amazed at how you all have addressed those have to do projects in the meantime because of course as you talked about with buckhorn getting the water on i know during uh, right after the flood you know our park also flooded so you had to have transportation uh, you all had a boat for people to go back and forth because they were flooded into the lodge the gas well the gas line that has been uh, you know we had to get warm and hot water to these folks yes. so so all of those repairs that you you took care of timely and um, I know that we're talking here today a lot about past present and future and I just think that um, you know they've always been a very important part of our commonwealth right now we're seeing how important they are and not only that during i know jenny wiley my park was also used for um our first responders during covid yes. if a first responder came home with covid and tested positive for covid we put them them up at the park so they wouldn't expose their families to those things so mm -hmm. they they've played an important role throughout the last few years and i think they're only going to play a very important role in the future especially in eastern kentucky so i just wanted to say thank you um and to not only you all but also to the staff who's worked so hard during this time thank you thank you very much Thank you, lady. Representative Heath. Well, I want to join with the others in, in saying uh, thank you. We're, um, I had not seen any of these numbers. I knew that the state parks were open to the tornado victims, but I had no idea how massive it was. Um, when the tornado came through, the immediate relief, the, the individuals were transported out to the Graves County Elementary Schools because they had power and water and sewer and there, there was a place for them to get in out of the weather and then they transitioned from there to state parks and, and wherever else uh, they could find a place so my question is we're coming up on the one year anniversary uh, of the tornado so do you guys still have tornado victims in the state parks or have they been transitioned out they've all been transitioned out as of was it July 17th is yes. that correct I believe and uh, representative I know that was uh, that was uh, an event down there and to to organize our efforts and and communicate um, our efforts and and be successful with it was was a big undertaking um, you know I want to thank our, our governor, Andy Bashir and his leadership, he did a great job. And uh, everyone with the administration, you all um, in our local communities did a fantastic job. I know me, myself, and, and my wife, Allison, we were there, I believe, Multiple 30 days. plus straight days. We did a couple back and forth um, back home to get stuff, but uh, um, Commissioner Vanover was down there for Christmas to give us a little relief. I know that, but uh, we were there with the people in the parks and uh, uh, making sure that they were taken care of and their stay was um, what it was supposed to be. So, yeah, well, it you. was very much appreciated. Just to give you some perspective, Mayfield Electric and Water, so that would be just in the city limits of Mayfield lost 400 residents and 150 businesses. So I don't know how many people were at each house. Obviously there's more than one in most of them. Mm -hmm. So there was just a, a lot of people that had to be, uh, that were displaced and, and had to find yeah. some quick relief. Uh, Representative Heath, uh, Commissioner and I were there probably about six or seven months ago and actually spoke, I think, to your Rotary Club there uh, mm -hmm. about the devastation and what we had done which is very helpful. Um, Mrs. Chairman, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about Director Sleeker with Kentucky Emergency Management. He's been extremely helpful. He was our former, former Colonel of our Ranger Division, and uh, he's been very helpful to all of us and have been very helpful to this entire Commonwealth, including our Rangers. Anything else, Representative Heath? I know that's important to your area. Have you got any yeah. other comments? Or? Well, I, w I would agree on uh, Jeremy Slinker. He, he was uh, the right man at the right time in the right place. So thank you. 
Senator Mills. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Y'all have been making the uh, tours of the committees recently, and I appreciate reports back uh, to us. Uh, and thank you for the work that you did in the Penny Royal State Park area. That's on the edge of my district, and I'm very appreciative of that. You were talking about uh, these relief rooms and giving us the count on there uh, as, as far as those rooms go. And then you just mentioned that everybody's been transitioned out, out west. Uh, any thoughts uh, as far as uh, funding and money to uh, go to these parks to, uh, quote, unquote, take care of wear and tear uh, that may, as, may have occurred from all of these uh, visits and rooms? Because, you know, we, we want those parks to be up to up to snuff uh they did uh some great work for the commonwealth and uh, i hope that we're looking at that in the future so any comments on that we definitely are in the proposal that we'll make to uh on the spending of the 150 million definitely are and and we will be getting reimbursed for for some of that uh um you know for the stays fema reimbursement but uh, as far as wear and tear reimbursement for the rooms I don't know how much of that we'll be we'll be getting, but uh, we we plan on, you know, using a good portion of this money, as you'll see, um, for uh, renovation of of lodge rooms. Thank you so much, Representative Baker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Tourism is such a vital part of, of our economy, and it especially is in our area. I live in the Lake Region as well, with Representative Branscombe. But one question related to state parks and, and the lodges that we have, could tell us what the occupancy rate was of the lodges in 2022 and the revenue and what the trends look like for the past one, three, and five years. Mm -hmm. you wanna... Some of that, Representative Baker, we would have to get that number back to. Can you pull that mic a little closer, please? Some of those numbers we'll have to get back to you in reference to the entire occupancy of the resorts, if that would be okay. Could, could you uh, perhaps the rest of the caucus may enjoy it as well but could you tell us is, is the trend are we moving in the right direction like it or not we, it state parks and any any government sure. agency is a business and just trying to see how we're doing financially covid was was a hurtful thing in terms of travelers wondering if they needed to travel or whether they wanted to stay at home but what we did see was those folks took advantage of our campground operations because they could be inside their own cabins. And that generated about 7.5 million a year so far. But you look at our highest occupancy, a lot of those numbers are coming back. Uh, Natural Bridge, for example, usually is setting about 68% occupancy for the entire year. That's our highest occupancy state park. And, and I'll add with that, um, Representative Baker and, and Commissioner Vanover, um, Natural Bridge, the rooms have been re renovated there. Correct. And with that said, um, it's, it's very, very, very important that we can solidify this money so we can put that money back into our lodges, which are starving for a renovation if you've been to any of them absolutely as of lately and and you know i i would guess to to say you know and i've been in this position two years as i came before your committee was it monday i was just here monday. um it's been a long time since a, a, a renovation has been done um, across the board in our parks and and the uh um reinvestment in our parks is is overly uh overly needed we we need to proceed with this and you're going to see those numbers increase after we do this but uh occupancy numbers yeah, thank you but we can get the we can get the current you know we can get you the past three we were actually talking in a meeting this uh before we came over here um we're gonna um try to get those numbers and have them in the report also but that's good uh, thank you yeah. guys can follow up madam chair so 68% was the occupancy rate at Natural Bridge. Was that 2022? That's pretty much consistent with 21, 22. 19 with COVID, it's kind of one of those years where what can you count? Yes. So it, what's the lowest? Which is the lowest park and what's that? And and just a comment aside, the rooms that have been renovated, the, those lodges have been renovated, are they seeing more traffic than the ones that have not? The ones that are renovated are seeing more traffic. Um, 
Buckhorn would be one of her lowest if we had to put one out there. And it's only because it's it's in in the region of where we need to do a little bit more marketing, no doubt. But that's part of this 150, where we need to get up to a standard of where we want to be. State parks, uh, many of them do a buffet. And so growing up, I thought the Kentucky State Parks were for the summertime. And mm-hmm. now I think they're just a wonderful place to spend the holidays. And you all, you don't have to shop or cook or clean or talk politics. <laughs> With your family. Great. Yep. Which park are you going to? I'm going to General Butler. That's a park. really good buffet up there. That's right. I Thank can you attest all. to that one. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Senator Southworth. Thank you. Um, I want to get a little bit more in depth on what I heard earlier about the park rangers and expanding. I think I heard expanding jurisdiction or whatever. Can I get, hear a little bit more about what we have in mind, or if we're not sure, what is the current jurisdiction of and training level of our park rangers? I think we'll let Colonel Crockett step into the mic on this one. Sure. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, the current training is um, they're all POP certified police officers, which mean uh, they carry the same certifications as any police officer in the state of Kentucky. They are required to uh, annually receive training with the uh, Department of Criminal Justice and currently, most of our rangers are retired state police troopers, uh, sheriff's deputies, and local police departments. Um, as far as the, uh, the current jurisdiction, a jurisdiction is limited to on-park property or a road that transverses through the park. Um, we've had a lot, of, a, a lot of things occurred over the past year that have kind of brought light to the jurisdictional issues. Uh, we've had the, uh, the tornadoes out in Western Kentucky, we had the flooding in Eastern Kentucky. We had an incident at uh, Carter Caves where a ranger was not on park property, was traveling to, to the park, came across a young child standing in a road. His parents had uh, crashed their car, overturned in a ravine, and uh, the uh, both parents and siblings perished in that crash. That ranger went into that uh, creek to try to save those individuals. Unfortunately, he was unable to. We also had the uh, devastating shooting in Allen, Kentucky, which was uh, roughly six miles from Jenny Wiley State Park. Rangers were on duty at that time. They could not respond to offer assistance to those officers that perished in that gun battle. Uh, we've also had, uh, there's, there's been some other issues with uh, accidents and wrecks and calls from assistance from local authorities where we've had to tell the, uh, the Rangers, no, you, you can't respond. But even on a daily basis, outside of these issues, the rangers have to travel to various parks throughout their shift. So they're on the road. Uh, They have to stop and get gas at gas stations. Things happen all over the place. Um, You know, there's nothing that says that the ranger's pumping gas for his vehicle and a domestic happens. Well, we're at a disadvantage. It's either, you know, and and most of my rangers are probably going to act and do the right thing, but it puts them at a, at a serious disadvantage because, number one, they have no legal authority to act in those situations. And, you know, the implications of not having that authority, it's, you know, it's sort of twofold. I mean, they, they take the risk of uh, civil lawsuits and whatnot. And, uh, you know, we, we've got to, I, I feel like it, it's, it's long overdue to, to kind of look at this and, and look at a solution. And I, I believe uh, Representative Fugate has, uh, has talked about this uh, last year, and what we're looking at is something similar to what Fish and Wildlife have, a statewide jurisdiction, but we would also have a, uh, a policy that, that basically nails that down to, hey, there's only certain c- circumstances that you're going to act outside of the, uh, the park. Thank you. I appreciate that. I think okay. the, that does answer my question, and I guess the thing we have to balance here is you know, should every POP certified officer be a state level police or should we figure out how we're doing jurisdictional lines? And earlier this week, we had another committee that talked about making the calls for assistance and reciprocity of jurisdiction an easier process. So perhaps it's not the jurisdictional area, but the process of getting additional help or doing things, um, you know, remotely and so forth. So very interesting. Thanks so much for going into that. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Does Representative Tackett-Lafferty have a follow-up? 
I just wanted to make one comment. Absolutely, and referencing, please. Referencing your the bill that you put forward, and which passed to celebrate 100 years of our parks in 2024. So, mm-hmm. our state parks. Um, you know, hopefully we'll see some celebrations celebrating those. I just wanted to mention that so maybe some folks can keep an eye out and look forward to attending those. That's awesome. Absolutely. Great observation, which circles back to our first set to of presenters. That was all all in the same piece of legislation. Are there any other comments or questions from the members? I would be remiss if I didn't recognize a special guest who's in the back if she would wave Kim Yeast. She has a long career history directly with tourism and is now serving the General Assembly assisting senators. So thank you for being here with us today and your many years of assisting tourism. We appreciate you in, in everything that you do. Do any of our retiring members have anything they would like to say in their final meeting with us? If so, just raise your hand and we'll make sure you're recognized. Representative Kirk McCormick. Um, I just want to say it's been a real pleasure serving on the tourism committee and um, as a retired state employee spent a lot of years uh, a lot of time at the state parks they were our home away from home we always kept the money within the system so anytime we had meetings and so forth there's not any of the parks in, in Kentucky that I haven't been to from General Butler to Buckhorn to Rough River and every single park is beautiful so um, I hope you guys continue to improve upon our park system and I, you know Kentucky is one of the be- most beautiful states uh, or well uh, the Commonwealth but um, it has been a pleasure to have served on this committee and I have learned so much uh, about the inner workings of everything so um, and to serve with everybody has been a pleasure um, so I'll look forward to keeping an eye on you all from out in the distance thank you thank you representative and thank you for your service we appreciate your service and wish you all the best in your future endeavors We don't have a December meeting on the schedule, but I look forward to seeing everyone uh, in regular session, which will gavel in on January the 3rd. If we would take just a brief moment and thank our staff, and I think it's the best staff around, our, our tourism committee. So please join me in thanking them for their hard work and dedication. Do we have a motion for adjournment? (laughs) <laughs> and a second.